scripture today comes from Exodus chapter 32, starting in verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us, who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. And Aaron said to him, Take off the gold rings that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a calf. And the people said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. When I was in youth group, one Sunday, or not some Sunday, on one on Wednesday night, the youth pastor, we walked into the room, and he had covered the entire sanctuary. Now, this was a, a fairly large church, so our youth room was a little bit smaller than this room. He had covered the entire place with cardboard. Uh, the floor was covered in cardboard, the stage was covered in cardboard, the walls up to about 10 feet high, covered in cardboard. And we are all wondering, what is going on? What is, what is it we're doing today? And for, we were only in the room for about five minutes once he actually started. And he told us, so often we put worship into a box. And so today we are going to take worship out of the box. We left the room and there were stations set up that we could worship through, uh, through scripture, through prayer, writing notes to one another, uh, through sitting in nature. I think there's even a station for running. But we, the point was to take worship outside of the box. And so we're only in the room for five, about five minutes. And so be, being the smart aleck I am, I walked up to my youth pastor and, and knowing the smart aleck I am, uh, figured something was coming. And I walked up and I said, you know, that's an awful lot of cardboard. And he said, yes, it is. And I told him, that's a, a, lot, a lot of work to make such a short point. And he said, but it's not a small point, is it? What I'm most surprised at when I look in this scripture is the actions of Aaron. Throughout the book of Exodus, Aaron has been the spokesperson for God. Uh, if you remember, Moses was terrified of public speaking, so Aaron was the one who, who was his spokesperson the whole time through his leadership. He's been a, he's been a strong leader at Moses' side through the plagues of Egypt, crossing the Red Sea, and for three months in the desert, he has been this faithful leader. So how do you go from being this great leader in the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, to in the very next scene, handcrafting them a new God in place of him? We don't understand Aaron's actions here, and I think the reason we don't is because there is a gap between our understanding and the world that he lives in. Our world is, is just a different place than the world that he was in. And so in order to understand this passage, this event of Israel worshiping the golden calf is a defining moment in their relationship with the God of Israel. More than just an interesting story, this is crucial to understanding what it means to worship what it means for us to be in a relationship with God. And so to understand what it means for us, we have to take ourselves outside of the box of our understanding and put ourselves into the box of ancient Israel. So the people saw that Moses was taking a long time. That's a great observation on their part as we read in Exodus 24. Moses has been up on this mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. That's the only indication that we're given about why do people do this? It doesn't say that they were angry. It doesn't say that they were uh, rebellious and were tired of God. It just says that they noticed that 
Moses was taking a long time. It might have started off as, you know, this Moses, Moses has taken a long while. He's been up there for some time. But it eventually it starts to turn into, what happened to him? And it turns into, if he's gone, what happens to us? Remember, Moses has been, Moses has been this whole time the link between the people and God. There was no scripture for them to connect with. There was no Ark of the Covenant. There was no priesthood. Moses was it. Aaron has been the spokesperson. He's been the voice. He's been the face of the movement. But it's always been clear that Moses was the source. And if he's gone, then what happens to them now? They've been parked in the desert for three months, and suddenly he's been gone for a month. And so what started off as, I wonder what's taking him so long, starts to turn into what's going to happen to us. Besides being an act of rebellion as they create this golden calf, what we see in this passage is it is an act of sheer panic. Frustration with Moses as a leader, but they are panicking. They are worried about what is going to happen to them. As we look at ancient worship in the ancient Near East, it's very common to have symbols that represent the presence of God among the people. Uh, much like you or I would wear a cross around our neck or uh, just have some kind of symbol, it represents God's presence with us as we live. But the only thing that this people of the God of Israel have is Moses. And he's wandered off. So naturally, they want something that's a little bit more permanent, or at least something less prone to wander off. And it just so happens that's what Moses is doing. Uh, throughout chapters 25 up to when we hear about the golden calf, he is receiving instructions from God to build the Ark of the Covenant, to build the tabernacle, these images that represent God's presence among the people. And so what we see here is that it's not so much of, they're, they're not necessarily rejecting God, but they're accepting a cheap substitute. They're taking a knockoff of religion. And so they go to Moses' number two and say, look, we don't know what's happening to this guy, but the people are panicking, so we need you to do something. And so Aaron builds the notorious golden calf. He said, it's common that people would re make a symbol that represents the presence of God. And the most common symbol of the time, would you, anyone want to take a guess? The most common symbol that people would make that would represent God's presence among them. Anyone want to guess? A bull. A bull represents strength. You've seen those things? They are sheer muscle. It represents strength. It represents health. Uh, if you have a goat, you've got some food. You've got milk. You've got a cow. Same thing. If you have a bull, you have prosperity. A bull represents strength. It represents health. It represents wealth in, in, in the ancient world. And so it's very common. Uh, you can see in the pictures above, um, you, see, you see deities standing on images of strength. Uh, there's one standing on a dog, one on a wolf, and uh, the one on the far right is standing on a lion. And so I wonder if Aaron is trying to, he's trying to do something right. Um, biblical historians and archaeologists say that making a golden calf was not necessarily turning away from God. And we see this because after making the calf, Aaron tells the people, tomorrow we're going to celebrate a festival to the Lord. So he doesn't think that he's doing something necessarily wrong. Uh, when a deity is depicted riding or standing on an image of strength, that's a statement of the God's strength. And so I wonder if Aaron is trying to point out to the invisible God standing over this calf, saying, Behold, Israel, this is, this is your God. But the people, our eyes are brought down, and say, These are your gods. Aaron does his best. He was given specific instructions to wait here for me. This, Moses told him, wait here for me and resolve any legal issues until I get back. He know, but, so he knows he's not following Moses' commands. 
But Moses is gone. So true to Exodus 20, uh, God instructs them that they are to speak to the people and take up an offering. So Aaron takes up an offering. God tells them to build an altar and sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. So Aaron builds an altar and they sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. And throughout the entire book of Exodus, before they even leave Egypt, the reason that they say that they're leaving is to celebrate a festival to the Lord. And so Aaron declares a festival to the Lord. I don't want to give him too much credit. It's obvious that he's trying to do something right. But I think he knows very well that what he's doing is not technically right. And it ends up being something terribly wrong. And as the people turn from God's presence, thousands die as a consequence. Aaron tries to point to the Lord, saying, here is your God. But our eyes are always brought down when people say, these are your gods. Paul is going to warn us later in Colossians to fix our eyes on Christ above. And he does that because our eyes are so naturally brought down to the things that are on this earth. The failing of Israel is not that they worshipped another god. It's that in their hunger for a religious experience, they exchanged the reality of God's presence, his promise, and his purpose for their lives for an imitation. God defines his presence by the ark. It's a box containing his promise to the people. But they exchange it for an image of worldly strength. God defines faithfulness by living according to his teaching. But the people exchange that for religious symbolism. God defines his purpose by telling them earlier in Exodus 19, you will be a nation of priests to the world for me. And they exchange it for religious festivals. And this is a theme that runs throughout Scripture. We see in Exodus 19 that God told the people of Israel, you will be a kingdom of priests to the world for me. He gave them laws to look out for the widows, orphans, foreigners, the poor, and the beat down. And later on, when the temple was built, God says, this will be a house of prayer for all nations. He tells the people, if you turn from me and abandon the instructions and commands I've given you, I will reject this temple that I've made holy for my name, and I will make it a joke insulted by everyone. And so as the people do end up turning from, from God for wealth and political power, and they neglect the widows, the orphans, the foreigners, the poor, and the beat down, God removes his presence from the temple, and it's destroyed. Then later, when Jesus is visiting the second temple, he, he talks about how the temple makes the things within it holy. The temple is a good thing. And yet, when his, he criticizes the temple leaders for, look, for overlooking the widows, the poor, the worn out and beat down. And so as the disciples say, look at these awesome stones and buildings. Jesus tells them, do you see these enormous buildings? Not one stone will be left on another. All will be destroyed. We are, we are people who feel things. Everything that we know, everything that we experience, comes through the things that we feel. We touch, we see, we hear, we smell, uh, we taste. Uh, this past week, we were at a conference, and we sang the song, I Surrender All. And that song means a lot to me because when I was young, we sang that song in my church. And I went through the motions, I said the words, but I wasn't living the life. And God used that song to really convict me, to bring me down on my knees and realize that I wasn't living that life of surrendering all. And so when, they, when we sang this song, uh, the worship leaders asked us to stand, but I didn't stand. I knelt down because to me, that's the right way to sing that song. They would have, have, this is the right way to do this song, to do this part of religion. 
Because we, we engage our world through our senses, and so therefore, we engage God through our senses. And God provided ways for us to connect with him through our senses. The Ark of the Covenant, the Tabernacle, the Temple, the Bread and Cup of Communion, the Water and Baptism. We connect to God through songs, through, through worship, through the candles that we light to represent God's presence. We connect to God through so many things that we touch, that we see, that we hear, that we smell. But when we have powerful religious experience, we start to connect the experience to the things. I have a friend who uh, she's a Christian, and she just she moved down to Indianapolis on the southeast side about six years ago. And so when she moved down, I was having this conversation with her. And I told her, hey, if, you, uh, if you'd like to check it out, there's this church that I know right in your area. Uh, they're doing incredible ministry. I think you'll love it. And she told me, well, she grew up in Episcopalian. And so she told me, well, if I'm going to go to church, uh, I, I really feel like it needs to be you know, the high liturgy, uh, robes, hymns, all that. But I told her, but you're not going to church at all right now. And she said, right. <laughs> to my knowledge, she's, she hasn't been to church yet in six years, but she knows how worship should be done right. There's something missing here. And each one of us does that. We connect the experience of God's love with a song, of God's presence with a style of worship, of God's power with a style of architecture. Aaron said, Behold, your God. But the people said, These are your gods, Israel. There's a very thin line between symbols and idols. And churches are full of symbols. But the moment that we need any one of them, when worship doesn't feel right without one of them, when we say, This is what worship is supposed to be, the symbolic value of those things is lost. The symbolic value that represents God's purpose for our lives, for who we are and what we are to do with our lives, is lost, and those things become an idol. God is not very concerned that his church develops a specific type of worship. He is very concerned that the people of his church are becoming a specific type of people. God told the Israelites at Sinai, You will be a kingdom of priests for me to the world. But instead of having faith in his presence so that they could become what he was forming them to be, they create a knockoff religion. Jesus told his followers, You are the light of the world. Go and make disciples of all nations, and I will be with you even to the end of the age. God continues to renew his covenant with people in every generation, even when we continually find ways to break it. In the Gospel of John, the woman at the well says, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors, wor our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you and your people say that we have to worship on this mountain in Jerusalem. And Jesus responds to her, A time is coming when you and your people will worship the Father, not on this mountain, or in this mountain, the time is coming, and it's here now, when true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. So how do we worship in spirit and truth? How do we, how do we take worship outside of the box? It isn't important if your worship is on this mountain or that one, with these songs or those, with this style or that one. The meaning and power of all that we do in worship, of all that we do in worship on Sunday mornings, comes from the reality of what God is doing in us throughout the week. If the songs and symbols aren't forming us by His presence, His promise, and His purpose for our lives, then they are as lifeless and meaningless as the calf of Israel. What's sacred in worship? is to love the Lord your God with all your strength.
to love one another and pray for those who give you a hard time. To give courage to each other in all of our struggles. To clothe our ourselves in compassion. To be the light of the world and to make disciples of Jesus Christ. The symbol that God gives us of his promise of faithfulness. It's not an ark. It's not the tabernacle. It's not a calf. It's not a church. Not a steeple. Not even a cross. The image he gives us is his son who died and resurrected. The image that he gives us for his continued presence with us it's not a church, not even the candles that we light to represent God's presence with us in worship. It's the Holy Spirit changing us. The Holy Spirit making a difference in our lives. This event of the golden calf is a defining moment for the people of Israel. It's a defining moment for us if we are willing to connect our story with it. God promises to, take, to make his... God takes us out of a former way of life into a new way of life. He promises to make his presence real in our lives as we make his love real to the world. God is faithful. And week after week, he gathers us in this box of symbols and reaffirms his covenant with us. And prone to wander as we are, very often instead of being formed into his people. We restrict worship, and we make it about what we do in the box. Real worship also needs to send us out of the box. Taking worship outside the box is not a small point. They left the cardboard out in our youth room, and the next week when we, went, when we came back, uh, we were told... Take all that we did in worship last week, all that we did outside the box, and I want you to bring that, that energy, that memory, back in the box. It was the most powerful night of worship I think we've ever had. Everything that we do here in worship, the, all the power that comes into the worship that we do here comes from what God is doing with us outside of the box. We need to take worship outside of the box. And we need to take what we're doing outside the box and bring it back into the worship that we do. To give meaning to the things that we do here. And if we don't take worship outside the box, we will miss out on the power of the presence, the promise, and the purpose of what God is doing in our lives. Every week, we light these candles and every week we take them out because they represent God's presence with us. Well, God's presence is out there with us. So as we go, let us also take worship outside of the box to become the people that God is forming us to be. Go with God.